She's also our editor-in-chief of Kindred Spirit, and when you have that kind of a title, you are leaned on during accreditation times to read all the materials as well. I read everything that we submitted. Sandy read everything that we submitted. Some of us read it more than once, and uh, she was a big part of that, uh, in, in addition to what she does normally uh, here on our campus, serving in our media arts and worship. She also, as I said, is the editor-in-chief of Kindred Spirit, our magazine. She's the author, <coughs> excuse me, of, or co-author of 18 books, including the Coffee Cup Bible Study series. Her nonfiction topics focus on marital intimacy, infertility, and bioethics. Lethal Harvest, one of her medical suspense novels, was a Christie Award finalist. A THM graduate of DTS, she earned her doctorate in aesthetic studies from the University of Texas at Dallas with a focus on writing, first century Ephesus, and the history of ideas about gender. She and her husband, Gary, also a DTS grad, have been married for 35 years, and their daughter, Alexandra, is 19. Uh, Sandy, it's great to introduce you as Dr. Sandra Guan, and we appreciate all that you do. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Sandy Guan? As a fourth of five children, I loved being in a big family. I loved the chaos on Christmas morning. I loved the seven-part harmony on road trips. And it was always on the road. We weren't flying because there were too many of us to fit in an airplane. I had one vision for myself as a result, for what I would do with my life. I wanted a big family too. I loved that. I wanted at least four kids. And so fast forward 22 years later when the Lord had something else in mind for me. I had a little bit of a gender crisis when I felt like the Lord was leading me to Dallas Seminary. My husband, who's here today, thank you, uh, encouraged me to come. And my pastor's wife, <clears throat> excuse me, was encouraging me to come. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was probably encouraging me to come. At the same time, I was thinking, I'm afraid I'm a woman entering a man's world. Is that right? Is this a violation of my gender? Now, it wasn't, it wasn't a few, but a few weeks later, I took that psychology test they used to take. They may still take it, but we don't take the same one. I've been assured of that. Um, because I was called in to the counseling department by a good friend who was a counselor here at the time, who had actually been our, uh, our supervisor when Gary and I worked with college group, uh, college group at our church. And he knew me really well, and he thought it was really ironic that the question had, had been flagged was the one about gender. And he called me in and he said, I have to meet with you, but it's so funny because I know you and I know this is an issue. Here's the question that this secular test, which is a little behind the times and needs updating, here's the question that was flagged. You said that you would rather read Sports Illustrated than Good Housekeeping. <laughs> and I said, that, that's true. And while I, I do like athletics, my daddy raised a girl who knew what a touchback was. He was thinking he was preparing me for a happy husband who couldn't care less. Um, <laughs> but, but the irony was I was reading Sports Illustrated because of the verbs. Like, it's good writing, and I'm a writer. And those writers can come up with a hundred ways to say they beat a team. We trounced, we stomped, we annihilated, we killed. Uh, and so I was reading it as a writer. So I was really getting more nervous about the whole gender thing, and I have a confession to make. I was, I was in Dallas, my husband was a seminary student in the THM program when DTS decided to allow women in the THM program, and I said it was a mistake. I repent, okay? If I had known, I would be up here today, oh, the irony of it all. <laughs> I repent, but at the time, I opposed it, and so as I was walking out the door, my first day of class, I had just this struggle in myself to the point where I did something I don't normally do, and that is I fell on my knees in front of my couch. And I said, Lord, if I'm doing the wrong thing here, please stop me. But if I'm not, I have to have peace from you that this is what you want me to do. I, I can't keep walking in doubt. And you know how the Holy Spirit sends that zinger sometimes? The one that came to my mind was a story I hadn't thought of in months. And it was the line, Mary has chosen what is better. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's a complete parallel to this. Her sister was doing the domestic thing, which is an important thing to do. But Mary was taking the male role uh, as a theology student, and Jesus was saying, back off. She's doing what she's supposed to be doing. 
And so I got up sort of stunned <laughs> because God tends to lead according to his word, right? <laughs> and so I got up and with perfect confidence walked out and went to class, having no idea where God was going to lead me, but clear that that is where I was supposed to be. Now this wasn't the first time at Dallas Seminary I had wrestled with some of the gender questions. Because when Gary enrolled in the THM program, we sat down as a partnership and said, it looks like if we want to emerge out of here with a happy marriage, I need to work full time and he's going to work part time while he goes to school. But the challenge with that is we had been to some marriage conferences that said, if I earned more than him, that would violate his manhood and it would violate my femininity. And my husband said to me, I think my manhood is stronger than that. <laughs> if it's for the glory of God, okay? And your femininity is stronger than that too. Those, those interpretations are important, but let's not lose track of our cultural setting if it's going to prohibit us from the glory of God. The glory of God always ranks higher than cultural gender roles. Now, that said, I realized that because I had these views, the problem wasn't with God, the problem was not with the Word, the problem was with my understanding of God's Word. And I see some of you already getting nervous, so I'm going to jump ahead and tell you, I believe in gender differences, and I'll get to that point, okay? <laughs> All right, so just go with me on this. My journey, here I wanted to be a mom of many kids, and God is leading me to theology, clearly. And I had to wrestle through, what does that mean? Where did I miss the boat in terms of my limited view that every woman doesn't have to be married? Every woman doesn't have to have children. That's not how God has it for everybody. So I went back to the beginning and started rereading the book to try to figure out where had I missed it. And it didn't take me very long. I was in Genesis 1. <laughs> I had always read it, heard it, thought it that God made men for dominion of the earth and women for reproduction. What's wrong with that? God made men and women to rule the earth together, and it takes two to tango, right? You need both for both. We need each other. It's a partnership. Whoa. And then I got to the book of Esther, and I had thought that courage was for men. And all those verses about fear not, fear not, fear not, including my fear of going to seminary, those are for me too. And as I reread Esther's story, I noticed that she was called Esther, Esther, Esther when she's kind of hiding. And when she donned her royal robe and she walked in and she stuck her neck out on the line, the text starts calling her the queen, the queen, Esther the queen. She started acting like the queen that she was because she had courage. In the face of fear, she plunged ahead for the glory of God. Then I got to that passage that had troubled me when Gary was a student, which is 1 Peter 5. And if you, if you turn, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 5, if you turn there with me. 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 10. The proof text had been that it's a man's job to provide, and it is, but starting with verse 3, honor widows who are truly in need. Honor widows who are truly in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, they should first learn to fulfill their duty toward their own household and so repay their parents what is owed them, for this is what pleases God. But the widow who is truly in need and completely on her own has set her hope on God and continues in her pleas and prayers night and day. But the one who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Reinforce these commands so that they will be above reproach, but if someone does not provide for one's own, especially that one's family. That one has denied the faith. No gender, context, widows. Jump down to verse 16. If a believing woman has widows in her family, let her help them. The church should not be burdened so that it may help the widows who are truly in need. You mean I have some responsibility in this? I can't hide anymore? It was a shock to me. We have to separate what's cultural from what's biblical, right? Because sometimes what's cultural can keep us from doing what's biblical. And I got a, a good look then at Proverbs 31, and I noticed for the first time 
She's got her own income and is buying field. And she's not, if she's not doing it because her family will starve if she doesn't do it. It's actually an upper class household and it's wisdom personified, right? And at the end of her life, her children and her husband look back on all the things she's done in her various eras and seasons and said, at this season of her life, she was buying and selling belts and buying and selling real estate, not so that she could be more rich, but so that she could stretch forth her hand to the needy and the teaching of Hesed would be on her tongue so that she has more credibility in the community and is an honor to her husband and is a joy to her children. I got a really good picture of what this looks like in an agrarian culture about five years ago when Gary and I were in East Africa. He's the East Africa uh, field leader uh, for East West Ministries. And we were working with Musa, who is a local chaplain with peacekeeping forces there who refuses to carry a weapon even though he has been issued one because he looks at the fact, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, Jesus told Peter to put away his sword and feels like in his peacekeeping, it, it just, he's more Christian if he goes in there truly coming without violence. And he took us to his home and his compound and he pointed to the chickens and he said, those chickens laying eggs, my wife, she gets them going and takes them to market, makes money, good wife. <laughs> See that garden? She planted it. Extra produce goes to the market, brings us money, good wife. And he's pointing, good wife, good wife, good wife, good wife, good wife, good wife, to all her little economic projects that are doing him good and not evil. So that this Christian man has more credibility in his community. I looked at Jacob making stew and Jesus cooking fish and was shocked to discover that deacons were serving the widows, not the women's ministry. Not that the women's ministry shouldn't. It just surprised me. And the biggest surprise of, of all was in Luke 6 when there were women financially supporting Jesus, the Son of Man. Clearly not a threat to his manhood or to their femininity. So when I enrolled at DTS, I was very interested in looking at the history of how we've thought about men and women, especially how the church has processed our views of gender. And I was, I was pretty amused, actually, when I got to 17th century France and was reading about godly men wearing silk stockings, lace, and long hair. Um, you know, that, that messed with my paradigms a little bit, too. But the, the best part of it all was when I got to the first century. And I came away with a much deeper appreciation of two men in the New Testament. The first one was the Apostle Paul. Because in the Greco-Roman world, to be manly meant to have great autonomy over your body. It meant nobody touches me and nobody looks on me, which is why gladiators and actors were actually shameful jobs. They were entertaining, but they were not considered manly because people could look on them where there might be some nakedness, there might be violence done to them, and certainly violence done to your body was a terrible thing. And a citizen wore the marks of citizenship on his clothing, right? And I thought about that and how how you must leave my body alone was a huge part of manhood. And I thought of Paul in Philippi, and he let them beat him up before he pulled the man card. Actually, he didn't pull the man card. He sacrificed his man card for the sake of the gospel. The gospel was a bigger priority than telling them, you have to leave my body alone. In fact, he leveraged his man cred for the gospel by sacrificing the very thing they considered cool. He said, something's way more important here. And he went on to write in Ephesians 5, not only do you give up your body, husbands, but she is your body. You're so vulnerable physically. Your body is vulnerable for the sake of the gospel. In fact, you're pointing to Christ who laid down his body. He was beat. He was spit on. And that was the second person I grew in a much more deep appreciation for was the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is the son of man who he gets to set the standard of manhood, right? And he's saying, put your sword away. Go ahead, beat me. Put the nails through my hands. Violate my body. Put me through shame because there's something more important. And that is I love the world. I'm willing to sacrifice my man card for the world. Now, at this point, I, I do imagine some of you are worried that I don't believe in gender differences. 
I do believe in gender differences. I believe in the complementary relationship of men and women, absolutely. I think the differences are there and we celebrate them. What I'm saying is, let's not let them become essentialism, where then a woman can't have courage because that's the man's job, okay? Because those things can get in the way of the Holy Spirit developing fruit in us. If our focus is manhood and womanhood, we can take our focus off of Jesus Christ. And it needs to come back to him because our truest masculine and feminine selves happen when we are pursuing Jesus Christ. I become the woman I'm supposed to be when I'm yielded to the Holy Spirit. And in a woman's body, I have love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And my husband is the man he's supposed to be when in a man's body, he has love, joy, peace, patience, etc. We become our truest selves when we celebrate the difference, but focus on the fruit of the Spirit, and Jesus Christ is the focus of our adoration. As part of that whole experience with UTD, I came to much more deeply appreciate one more man, and that was a contemporary man, and it was a man on this campus. As DTS graciously opened up to me the archives of our history on the question and let me explore how we had processed it theologically, where I had missed the boat, in my thinking, I discovered in our history, Dr. Donald Campbell, behind the scenes, had been an absolutely fearless advocate on behalf of women. He had met privately with students. He had met privately with faculty. He had met privately with the board. He held meetings. He wrote endless, endless memos and letters exegeting the scriptures. And he said to me in an interview I did with him about it, he said, people told me, they accused me of capitulating to American culture. I didn't care about American culture. I was traveling all over the world and I was meeting our alumni. And without exception, you know what our alumni were saying? All hands on deck. If you don't want them, send them to us, but train them. Anybody, anybody who's willing to get training, send them to us because the time is short and it won't be long until the Lord himself, say it with me, will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord, the Son of Man. Pray with me if you would. Yeah. <sighs> Immortal, invisible, only wise God, before whom angels bow and archangels veil their faces. Thank you for your son. Thank you that he was spit on and mocked and scorned and humiliated because of love. Thank you for those who have gone before us who are not ashamed of the gospel. Make us the men and women you want us to be careful with your word, sensitive to your spirit, bearing fruit, laboring in your fields until he comes. Help us to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.